All right, let's talk about uh, cooking in the backcountry. Um, this first part of the video, we will talk about different types of stoves, and then we will go outside and actually cook something, probably just uh, a freeze-dried meal or something like that. So we're gonna talk about the three main types of stoves, and the main way that you categorize stoves is about the type of fuel that they use. So I've got a, a white gas, um, actually a multi-fuel stove here. The biggest one, um, uh, an isobutane, a, a little tiny one, the ones that are becoming more popular because they're lightweight, and kind of an older style of a, um, a alcohol stove. And uh, we'll kind of look at these and then talk about a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of, of each. So the, the, the older style, the white gas, um, these stoves are heavier, but they're super reliant, uh, reliable. Um, and they are fuel repairable. The fuel has a lot of uh, high BTUs per um, volume. So even though you're carrying a heavier stove, if you're using this over a long period of time, uh, you're carrying less fuel. Uh, so here's the stove. I've got a windscreen, the stove itself, and a pump. Um, these work on white gas. This is what you'd go in the store and actually buy, but you'd pour that um, into one of these little fuel canisters that you can get uh, of various sizes. So the way this works, pump goes in the, the fuel canister. The stove's got a, a line that connects to this. You pressurize it, uh, light it, and then that'll, that'll preheat the stove. It warms up, converts that into gas, and, and then starts burning. Um, these can take a little bit of uh, uh, experience to use. I've had problems where they kind of burst into to flames and um, you, you can encounter problems. So these uh, uh, you definitely want to kind of get to know and get to know your stove and what works well. Some of them are like jet engines. You turn them on and they are going to heat up something really fast. Some of them, like this one actually has a really good simmer. I can, I can cook really slowly with that. All right, so that's that's white gas, the more traditional. These stoves tend to be more expensive, um, but potentially will last you a, a lifetime. Um, a lot of the a lot of these come with are easily to find uh, find parts and repair uh, and to rebuild and to have a last a really long time. The next is the the, the isobutane. These are simpler and a, a lot lighter. So this is a titanium um, Amazon made in, in China, a little tiny stove. Uh, MSR, one of the main companies that makes lots of stoves, has a little pocket rocket. I own one, but apparently all my children have stolen my backpacking gear, so I don't have that. So this has got some little arms that fold out um, that make the place where you actually set your stove. Fairly small, so this one I'd have a little bit of concerns about being sturdy enough. And then fuel canisters. Um, so isobutane fuel canisters. Get them of various sizes. They make some beefy ones and then some tiny ones. And depending on how long your trip is, uh, you pick different size stoves. The advantages of these are the, the some of these are fairly inexpensive. So relatively in low initial cost. Um, and fewer moving parts, less maintenance. Um, they tend to work or not work. Um, for the most part, I've never had trouble with these, but when you do have trouble, it's there's not much that you can repair out in the field. I have some had some bad canisters, so I tend to get the, the name brand canisters like MSR uh, instead of the stuff that you can get at Walmart. So this is fairly simple. Uh, you pop this top off, you screw this on, you've got one valve to turn on and off the gas. Uh, there's no priming, no preheating. You start that puppy and, and, and it goes. And again, some of these are, are kind of full blast or off, uh, or, and some you can simmer fairly well. This one's kind of full blast uh, or, or off. Um, these, the advantage, light, lighter for the stove. The fuel, though, tends to be heavier because you're carrying these containers. They're not refillable. Um, not the most environmentally friendly thing because once you're done with these, uh, they're kind of hard to recycle. Uh, you've got to puncture it and get all the gas out of it. It can be a little dangerous. Um, so that, from an environmental standpoint, leave no trace. These aren't the great, greatest. Um, they also don't work really well in colder weather. Uh, they've messed around with the fuel mixture to do a little better in cold weather. This is an all-season fuel blend. Um, but below freezing, um, they don't. 
uh, they don't work as well. The fuel is also pretty high in BTUs. So again, the, the, for the volume of fuel and the heat that you get, not bad. Uh, the last type we'll talk about is the, the alcohol stoves. These are a little bit older. Um, these are also pretty inexpensive and these have no moving parts whatsoever. Um, these you pour the fuel in and then light it and then there's little valves out here that, that it starts off with a yellow flame and once it gets warm that'll turn into a, a blue flame. Now you're wondering how you get your pot set on top of that. There's various different ways of, of uh, and techniques of buying things that the pot sits on. This is a little titanium thing that's super lightweight, goes over the top, you put your pot on top uh, and, and it heats up there. This is a little problem with, with the base, um, getting that to lie flat, uh, particularly on your on surfaces that you find in the backcountry. Fuel is really cheap and pretty available. This is the same thing you put in your gas lines when the, during winter. And um, so it's fairly easy to get a hold of in a very variety of different locations. Um, these, the, it, the advantage that this is, this is not a fossil fuel. Uh, so it's a little bit more renewable, a little bit greener to be using this as a fuel. The, the energy content of the alcohol is much lower though. So you need to carry more fuel um, and on a longer trip, that may be an impediment. So in this, that means that this takes a little bit longer to heat something up. And so if I'm trying to boil something, you know, the other stoves may boil in two minutes. This may take four minutes, five minutes, uh, obviously depending on the amount of water that you have. So those are our three main types of stoves. That I, the, you know, I, one of the other pitfalls that I forgot to say on, on the, the isobutane is it also has the same problem or challenge to get this to lie flat. Um, when you take this big container, you put that on top of it, put a pot of water on top of that, and on an uneven surface, uh, there's a good potential that that thing might flip over. Um, and that's where the white gas stove, that first stove, it's probably the most stable on a variety of different surfaces. All right. Um, We'll talk a little bit about pots uh, when we go outside. That's not really the focus of this. A few other things that you would have with your stove. Um, the white gas stove came with a windscreen. The isobutane typically does not. And so you may even need to ad lib with something you've got in your pack or use a variety of different windscreens that you can buy uh, that you can put around your pot. They're particularly vulnerable to have the, a lot of the heat blown away. Uh, so you do want some kind of windscreen. Some of these, like the jet boil that work off of isobutene, have a built-in windscreen. So that's not as much of a concern. Um, and then something I won't mention outside, cleaning up later. I also, I've got a couple of tiny little sponges I've cut apart. This is a backpacking towel that I've cut into a small little piece. And your uh, your 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 uh, soap that you're going to use. Um, I try not to use any soap at all. If I'm cleaning, I, I just uh, will use water, uh, often a little bit of hot water, and try to just rinse it out and drink it. Uh, if I do need soap, uh, it probably means I probably burnt something, and that means you weren't cooking and paying as much attention as you should. And this is the kind of stuff that says it's biodegradable. You never, 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 ever just pour this back into the stream. If you wash out a pot with this and have that soapy water, you want to cast that far and wide across some surface, hopefully something like rock or whatever, where there'll be some UV that'll help break this stuff down. Uh, but never be pouring this back into the stream. It is not instantly biodegradable and takes a while and could be toxic in that local stream. All right, let's go outside and uh, cook something. All right, I lied. Let's do talk about pots a little bit. Um, I'll show you kind of the three main types of pots that you'll run across uh, when you go shopping for this stuff. Um, we've got, starting out here, a stainless steel pot. So the one that's probably the most heavy, but probably the most durable and the least concerns about getting uh, smashed too much in your pack and um, that may not have any residue that ends up in, in your food that could be unhealthy. Um, so pretty simple. Uh, this has been cleaned off a, a, a lot because if I used it in a fire or whatever, I get a lot of soot on it, so I keep that pretty clean. Um, you want in some of these things a fairly smooth side, not a lot of curves and things that will catch food because uh, you will almost always inevitably burn something. Uh, and then what you also want is a locking handle. So one of the things I don't like about this pot is this handle tends to be a little bit loose. While I'm cooking, it'll drop and fall over and get really hot. 
and then I go to oh, oh, grab the pot, and I have burned my finger multiple times on that. For any any uh, pot you use in the backcountry, you want to have a lid. Uh, you probably know why that that helps things boil faster and conserve fuel. You're not using as much fuel, so always always have a lid. They do have some um, pots now that just have plastic lids that they you know they're, you're not going to get hot. This one's always advertised as you can use the pot kind of as as a, a skillet. I don't think I've ever done that probably using it as a skillet is going to stick all kinds of stuff in there. I can't imagine making pancakes or anything else like that in there. So stainless steel. Um, moving up the ladder, we've got uh, an aluminum pot. Uh, these are going to be a little bit lighter, a little, a little uh, less um, bash resistant. Uh, and in this case, this is one that's anodized. Uh, that makes a little bit more of kind of a non-stick smooth surface. And... The, this one's also got some nice little handles that swing out. Uh, so before I cook, uh, I want to make sure that those go out so they don't get too hot. And they're rubberized so that, again, that keeps me from burning my hands uh, when I'm moving things around. I've got the main pot and, and, a, and a lid. Again, this is one of those lids that supposedly can be used for something else, but it's probably just as, like, at most, if you had a buddy, is that you could make a two-person meal in here and then split it and then use that as, as a almost like a plate. Um, and this one is one of those that's kind of got a little bit too much of an edge there. It makes it a little harder to clean, and these things make it a little bit harder to clean. Um, and it's got some printing on the side that can catch some food. So that's the kind of stuff that I, I generally try to avoid. Um, but this is definitely lighter being aluminum than the stainless pot. Uh, per volume and then on the, the high end and this is stuff that is just kind of recently become available it used to be just way too expensive uh, is titanium um, this one nicely nests one of my fuel canisters and there's an example of one of those little sponges and a lighter uh, so these uh, on the scale of weight these are the the lightest you can get these days um, per volume um, Still pretty durable, so it takes a lot to kind of crush this. Um, and but so this is stuff that's still fairly expensive, but the price is coming down a lot to get titanium um, pots. And this has a nice uh, example of a lid that's just a lid and probably doesn't need to be anything else. This one does not have as good of a, a handle system for uh, grabbing it when it when it's um, really hot. So I find I have to use like uh, some cloth or whatever to grab this. Um, the other thing you often are doing, especially when you're boiling water, and something I would test at home, is that all these things you're going to end up, let's say, pouring this into a freeze-dried packet or something. So how well do these things pour? This has got a rolled lip, but no little crease there. So I potentially have water pouring down the side and losing some of the water that I've carefully um, filtered and boiled. Um, so this doesn't have a great pour lip. Uh, this aluminum one, it's got a little pour lip here. That's 90 degrees from the handle. That's probably the best pour lip. And probably the worst of the three to pour out is this beast here. Um, this thing's really hard to pour out of because it doesn't have a pour lip and it's, it's fairly uh, shallow on the curve and the handle's not great. So even though it locks, trying to pour water out of that uh, makes it pretty difficult. So those kinds of stoves, uh, pots that you can get and some of the things you want to think about when you decide on, on which one to get. The size, this is all relative to the number of people you're going to have on a trip. This one's nice for uh, making meals for two, maybe three people. Uh, and all these others I have are really almost too small for uh, two people. These are, if I'm going to cook water or a meal, that's not enough food for two people. That's certainly not enough for food for two people. So if I'm doing freeze-dried, I'm going to have to boil water in these twice in order to make enough freeze uh, water for the freeze-dried meals. So these are more solo stuff or a single person st uh, pots. So this, and I actually have one that's bigger that I've used for trips when I've had three or even four people.